so you know this is a presentation uh, which is uh, which deals with you know um, uh, basically with microalloys and hsl steels which are uh, which are very dominant in the uh, commercial world so just to do a context setting uh, you know welding uh, introduces heat to a job you know so this is uh, my, this i think so everybody knows uh, that during a fusion process or any any of the welding processes heat is uh, the vital entity of um, uh, uh, of um, uh, any any welding process. Uh, just hold on. I'll uh, give me the laser pointer. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> now uh, this heat, you know, causes uh, temperature rise in the vicinity of the heat source, and yeah, uh, causes the uh, vicinity in the heat source. And you know, uh, in, uh, and the nearby locations of the thermal cycle, and uh, you know, each of these locations experiences a thermal cycle. Now, uh, the peak temperatures attained at these locations are indicated uh, through the temperature isotherms, and uh, the temporal conditions uh, are uh, like uh, like a rapid heat treatment. You know, we are familiar with annealing, normalizing. Uh, uh, Quenching and tempering, all those stuffs, you know, which are very normal, but uh, but uh, there's a difference in uh, the welding thermal cycles that you know there is no holding period. It's a transient process that you, it it attains a high temperature and then immediately drops, and that makes it uh, different from the other heat treatment processes. But but it, 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 it there is a heat treatment uh, in the in the product uh, material uh, which causes the heat affected zone. And has is critical from a steel product perspective, you know, uh, whether it is, you know, the new generation of uh, thermomechanically uh, treated product as steels, you know, uh, or the, or the, or the uh, quenched and tempered steels, you know, so the hot rolled quenched and tempered steel. So the heat uh, affected zone is very critical because it entirely alters the original microstructure. You know, there's a lot of effort putting uh, or creating the original microstructure. In any of the materials, you know, there's such a lot of investments made in very special rolling mills and um, uh, TMCT processes. But a very small, uh, but a very small manufacturing process like welding would alter the entire uh, um, uh, product properties near the vicinity of the fusion line, and that could, uh, in time, at times, uh, you know, result in catastrophe. So you know, you need to maintain uh, some of the acceptance quality uh, while you are doing welding. Keeping in mind the history of the material uh, and uh, the, uh, the application requirements. Now, has is vital uh, for advanced high strength HSL and microalloy steel. And though you know it sounds very conventional that HSL steels have been uh, you know been dealing with HSL steels for the last 50 years, but you know there is no end um, uh, to some of these steels. You know, and there is still a lot of uh, excitement. Uh, uh, you know, while you know we are dealing with the third generation of emerging steels, uh, in terms of you know we're talking about uh, dual phase steels, but now you know there is more of ferrite benite. Again, it's a, it is a dual phase steel, but of a different genre. Uh, complex phase steels. Uh, today we are talking about medium manganese steels. You know, because we not only want high strength. Uh, you know the concept. You know the metallurgical concept with which we have been brought up is that as you go on the as you go higher on the strength. You need to sacrifice on the elongation or the toughness of the property, but you know the new generation of uh, steels uh, are aiming at both enhancing the uh, the toughness, uh, the strength of the steel as well as the uh, elongation and toughness values. And then the uh, armor steels, you know, the armor steels are coming up in a big way, and particularly in India, you know, with a lot of uh, defense, uh, uh, you know, uh, interests, uh, and there are a lot of imports happening. Uh, it is, I think, the so right time that, uh, and, and and there are signals where the Indian defense is now looking for, uh, you know, a very high quality of uh, armor steels at par with the best in the world. And uh, today, even we are talking about uh, 1.5 to 2 GPA high strength steels, uh, you know, both in, uh, in particularly in the hot rolled conditions. And you know, these require special attention because whatever steels you produce, they all need to be welded, and therefore the weldability aspects are uh, vital. To any of the volume production, uh, volume uh, produced uh, commercial steels. Now, you know, with this context setting, I, I, I will get into you know the the the, the phenomenological aspects of how uh, you know uh, the the grains uh, or the heat affected zone uh, 
is developed. So, you know, if you take a case an example of a GMAW uh, welding, you know, which is gas metal arc welding or the MIG welding convention. So what you see on, uh, uh, you know, is basically uh, how uh, a welding takes place. You know, if you, 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 you start the welding from one end to another. And, you know, the, the, the most of the heat sources are the Gaussian heat sources. So, uh, well, you know, while uh, this, uh, you know, under the, under the pseudo stationary condition, the weld uh, source moves. You know, it creates the uh, the isotherms. You know these uh, you know, these oval uh, diagrams. You know they represent uh, you know the isotherms of the peak temperatures that uh, the locate uh, that locality experiences. So if this is the heat source, you know which is the Gaussian source, as I said, and um, yeah, so this is the, this is this this will experience the maximum temperature. You can see in you know, fifteen hundred degrees centigrade, for example. And as you move away from the heat source, the temperature keeps on falling. And as you go far away, it is, uh, you know, it, it, it will drop. So from 1500 to 200 uh, degrees centigrade, this is a casing example of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, the isotherms. But again, each of these isotherms, you know, they reflect on the temperature uh, profiles or the, temp the temporal conditions, you know, uh, they experience. So, uh, and uh, as you see, that, uh, you know, if this, uh, the, uh, the center of the weld would experience the maximum um, uh, peak temperature. But as you uh, get away from the center of the weld into the heat affected zone, then the temperature, uh, you know, uh, the peak temperature keeps on falling. Now, depending on the heat input, you know, um, um, uh, not only the heat input, but on the plate thickness also, or the, or the volume of the material, the thermal profiles, uh, you know, would be developed. Or the thermal profiles would depend on the heat input as well as uh, the thickness of the material. And uh, so what is vital is, uh, you know, the peak temperature and the cooling rate. You know, these two are uh, very important. But, uh, you know, uh, but within this thermal profile, uh, in case of steels, you know, the portion that uh, or the the, the, the residence time of the thermal cycle above the AC3 temperature or in the austenite, austenite regime, you know, is, is, is very critical because, um, you know, that has a major, major influence on the heat affected zone. So, you know, if you look at this, uh, you know, this is, this, this is a, a, a CISWELD simulated uh, uh, heat affected zone uh, where you can see, you know, the pink portion is the weld portion, you know, symmetric, you know, this is the actual weld. If you, if you draw a symmetry uh, using a cis weld, uh, this uh, purple portion is the weld metal. But you know, then subsequently the yellow, light blue, and the deep blue are the three different heat affected um, zones. Where you know it could be the coarse grain heat affected zone, the fine grain heat affected zone, and uh, the uh, intercritical uh, heat affected zone. And you also could get a subcritical heat affected zone. And <clears throat> so this yellow zone is. Uh, is uh, represents the th or, uh, you know the thermal profile of this yellow zone would represent a higher peak temperature than the one uh, with the, the deep uh, uh, blue zone. You know, so each of these zones basically reflect on uh, the different um, uh, on different thermal profiles with different peak temperatures and um, uh, the cooling profile uh, and the cooling rates. Now, <clears throat> if I go to this um, the next slide. Uh, you know, and I'll give a casing example, taking the thermal profiles that I mentioned. If you consider an ASTM A68656 uh, uh, steel, you know, my X8 steel with a YS of 550 MPA. Now, you know, the, the point I would like to say is um, if you look at this uh, uh, plot, you know, where it says the prior austenite drain size, you know. So uh, if your peak temperature is uh, from 800 to say 1400 degrees centigrade, you know, beyond 1400 degrees centigrade, uh, uh, you know, it would attain melting point. So the heat affected zone would typically lie between, you know, um, say around 800 to 1400 degrees centigrade. Uh, and um, uh, for uh, two different heat inputs, you know, in this particular steel, you can see how the austenite, uh, uh, austenite drain size, you know, or, or and otherwise, which, which we call the prior austenite drain size, uh, you know, how the size increases, uh, uh, size increases as the temperature increases, uh, as the peak temperature increases. So, uh, you know, if this is my peak temperature, uh, so, you know, this, at this peak temperature, you would, uh, you would be getting 
in grain sizes of say 120 micrometers. But um, you know, at a, at a lower uh, thermal uh, um, peak temperature, you would be getting uh, say around 40 micrometers of um, austenite grain size. So you know, uh, if you look at this right figure, then you would see how the grain size changes. You know, the prior austenite grain size changes. So from say around you know hardly 10 15 micrometers in the as received condition, and uh, you know for this steel you know this is basically uh, aliphromorphic ferrite bainitic uh, sort of a microstructure. Um, as it goes high on the peak temperature, you need to focus uh, on the prior austenite grain size. You know uh, right now at, in this slide you know uh, where we are talking about event one, which is the austenite grain size, you need not uh, focus on what is inside prior austenite grains. But if you focus only on the prior austenite grains, you would see that, you know, uh, with peak temperature, you know, how the size increases. And this is, uh, you know, uh, the, this is uh, a very, very major part of the heat affected zone. And, you know, this represents a 10 kilojoule centimeter uh, heat input. But in, if you have a 40 kilojoule heat input, then, you know, the prior austenite grains are going to get larger. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, there are there, you know there is a certain concept uh, uh, which uh, uh, which deals with uh, how the grain size uh, increases um, in the in, in the heat affected zone. Now, if if I, if I talk about the same steel, you know, so you know this is phenological model, so this this steel, but you know just for some some of the calculations which we did for this steel, you would see that you know if these are the two peak temperatures, you know the TP one and TP two. And if you look at you know the um, the the you know these this temperature cycle basically represents uh, you know a function the temperature as a function of time. Then uh, what is important is the portion above the AC three temperature. Okay, so uh, so you know the uh, if you uh, now the portion of the AC uh, the portion of the AC three temperature which impacts the prior austenite grain size is best represented or best uh, represented by the strength of the thermal cycle. Now, you know, the kinetic strength is basically the, uh, the, the energy content which influences, uh, you know, the austenite grain growth in, in, in a system, in, in any of the steels, you know. And uh, uh, what is important is in most of the HSL steels, you have a lot of micro elements and therefore there are uh, precipitates and there are other alloying elements, yeah. And you know the precipitates as well as you know the the solute solution elements in the monadium, you know they they impart a Jenner drag effect. So you know there are two situations where uh, you know the uh, what would be the grain growth, uh, you know, under the impact of uh, you know the peak temperature prior to precipitation dissolution, and what would be after the precipitation uh, after you know the precipitates dissolve in the system because the precipitates are not going to remain. Um, in the uh, heat affected zone at very high uh, peak temperatures, okay, because they follow a certain uh, dissolution uh, conditions, so uh, so uh, or solubility conditions. So you need to look at the solubility of the microalloying elements, and uh, we know you know the uh, primarily vanadium, niobium, and titanium. Uh, you know they chronologically dissolve in the system, with titanium holding on for a longer time. But you know the effect. Uh, but titanium precipitates that. You get in rolled steels, you know, they increase uh, the peak temperature. Now, so so if you look at the kinetic strength of uh, you know the thermal cycles, you know, uh, with precipitates, you know, they would be a, a, a smaller entity of the, of the total kinetic strength of the cycle. So if I C is my uh, peak, I C is my uh, total kinetic strength. It consists of two components, which is the I A, which is the kinetic strength till the precipitates uh, uh, got dissolved, and the kinetic strength, uh, you know, beyond uh, the precipitate dissolution point. So you know the I B, which is I C minus I A, has a major major role as far as uh, uh, prior austenite grain size is concerned. As uh, as you know, the Zener drag effect, uh, you know, it it drops as uh, you as the temperature goes up. So you know, if you follow this, you know there is a very uh, there, there are several papers, you know, and there are detailed papers and analytical models on the subject, you know, which have dealt with you know how uh, uh, to uh, what extent you know the grain size um, uh, goes up 
uh, uh, under uh, under this uh, under these two effects, you know. So mm -hmm. so in this case, as you see, that um, at 40 kilojoules at 1190 degrees centigrade, most of the precipitates have gone into solution. So uh, so once that has happened, uh, the rest of the kinetic strength takes over, and uh, you know in in the following slide, you know I will tell you. No, no, and no, no. In fact, uh, I should go to the previous slide, and you know this influences you know the the grain growth or the austenite grain size, uh, which has happened. You know the rapid austenite grain size which happens uh, uh, beyond 1200 degrees centigrade. Uh, is there a problem? Am I audible? Yes, uh, am I am I audible? Okay. Is it okay? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, you know sometimes I, I yeah. Uh, so uh, so for this so this is uh, you know this is event one which I said you know which is the prior austenite grain size in the heat affected zone, and you know you know different zones in the heat affected zone which I explained would have different uh, 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 grain sizes. Now once you have the grain sizes, now uh, you know that is uh, uh, the effect of um, you know the the the, the peak temperature. But subsequently, the peak temperature is not going to remain. You know, there is going to be a cooling rate following the peak temperature, and you know the subsequent uh, slide. You know, which is the cooling, uh, how the cooling rate influences phase transformation, and that is event two. Okay, so uh, and uh, you should all note, you know, that uh, uh, unlike uh, annealing or normalizing, the entire welding process or the welding thermal cycles are non-linear heating and cooling. So, uh, so you know the uh, the the CCT or the well CCTs, you know, they have to be specially developed for nonlinear uh, cooling conditions. And you know, this is uh, this is the casing examples of the same steels that we have been dealing with, uh, the HSLA steels, you know, uh, with a carbon equivalent value of 0 0.50. And you know, if you look into the rich chemistry that is there, you know, so uh, uh, under the sort of cooling rates which I said, you know, under the 10 kilojoules uh, 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 kilojoule centimeter effect. The cooling rates are pretty fast under those conditions. You see that the transformation start temperature, or there is a suppression of, uh, you know, the phase transformation temperatures have been happening from austenite to the lower phases. And if you if you look at uh, this particular steel, you know, you will see that at around 40 degrees centigrade is the martensitic start temperature, you know, notional martensitic start temperature, you know. And um, uh, when you uh, cool from say TP 1000 degrees centigrade to TP 1200 degrees centigrade, and you know this, uh, the 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 CCT diagrams which are which are generated from the dilatation plots, you know, uh, under a global uh, from a, from a global uh, simulated samples, you will see that um, uh, you know the significant uh, drop in the transformation uh, temperature. So in case of 1000 degrees centigrade, you know, where the prior austenite grains are, are are relatively smaller. Uh, you know they don't grow much because the peak temperatures are smaller so you still have a lot of nucleation uh, sites available because of the grain size so you still uh, you know and that results in the formation of acicular ferrite or uh, you know allotory allotromorphic ferrite um, um, ferrite but subsequently you know um, you know uh, uh, but along with uh, uh, with uh, allotropic ferrite you also get bainite and uh, acicular ferrite uh, sort of structures but below the MS temperature, where I think so, 50% of the transformation is taking place, you get, uh, you know, entirely lath martensite, and the and the morphology of the lath martensite would depend on again the cooling rates or the or the heat input. Now, the, uh, so if you are looking at, uh, you know, in case of 10 kilojoules per centimeter, is basically the left, uh, uh, you know, the left plot, you know, the left curve. But you know, if you are going for 40 kilojoules per centimeter, you know, the, this is the so the so the the morphology is going to change from the left to the right, you know. So you're going to have finer lates, um, or finer structures because of the cooling rates um, uh, uh, on the uh, faster cooling rates. But you would perhaps get more of granular bainite or granular um, uh, structures as you uh, as you go uh, as the cooling rates are slowed down. Uh, similarly, with the lath metan site, also the inter inter uh, lamellar spacings of the lath are going to change, you know. And that is exactly what happens, uh, you know, under the influences of uh, the uh, the heat inputs uh, and the cooling rates. Uh, again, it, uh, if you take it 1200 degrees centigrade, and as I mentioned earlier, that at 1190 degrees centigrade, most of the precipitates have gone into solution. So you know you are basically having an austenite which is uh, precipitation free, and uh, you know so there is a significant amount of grain growth uh, which is taking place. 
So under the influence of the cooling rate, you know, since the hardability has now gone, you know, there is an entire shift in the transformation temperature. And, uh, you know, you can see that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the higher temperatures, you know, around 570 or something like which you observed uh, at 1000 uh, TP has now gone down to around, uh, you know, 440 degrees or 450 degrees centigrade. And there is a slight inclination, you know. So if, if there is a slower cooling rate because of the of a higher heat input of say 40 kilojoules per centimeter, uh, centimeter, then you still still have the probability of getting some, uh, you know, allotrope of uh, acicular ferrite or bionitic microstructures, but bulk of your microstructures would be late martensites, uh, late martensite. You know, so you know this 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 is you know this phenomena is more or less true for all the steels. But yes, you know the chemistry would uh, is vital uh, and would determine uh, you know to what extent the, you know, the transformation suppressions are happening under the very rapid nonlinear cooling conditions experienced uh, during welding. Now, uh, if I go to the uh, you know, next slide, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, it, it is just a derivative of what I said, that if you look at the phase, uh, phase transformation or the phase austenite transform you know, uh, under uh, 10 kilojoules per centimeter under 1200 degrees centigrade, then you will see that bulk of the transformation has happened below 440 uh, degrees centigrade, which is the martensite start, uh, start temperature. So all transformations here uh, would represent, you know, uh, late martensite, you know, and therefore, and this is exactly what you get in this microstructure you know, of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, say this X eta grade steel with uh, 10 kilojoules per centimeter. Oh, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, and you know this, this uh, you know this late martin site, it represents the highest uh, hardness uh, values. You know, again, if you have uh, you know if you go to higher TP values of say um, fourteen hundred degrees centigrade, there also you will get last martin site. But you know in that case you know you, the interlaminar spacings would go up. You have you would have lower grain boundaries, and therefore you know there would be a slight fall in the microstructures in the phase transformed uh, conditions. So you know, if, if uh, for uh, for this particular steels, you know, uh, for this particular steel, you know, this uh, 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 temperature, twelve hundred degrees centigrade TP, would give you the maximum uh, hardness properties uh, in the in in the in the heat affected zone. Now, uh, you know, if I uh, if I go to the uh, uh, now, you know, this is again representing the same steel. At uh, 40 kilojoules per centi uh, uh, kilojoules per centimeter, and uh, as I have mentioned, that as you uh, go higher on the heat input, your cooling rates uh, slow down, and therefore, uh, you know this is uh, uh, you know at 1100 degrees centigrade, you see very fine microstructure, uh, but at at 1300 degrees centigrade, you can see the the uh, the uh, you know uh, the prior austenite train size has gone up. And inside the grains, you have a combination of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, late martensite, uh, you know, primarily late martensite, uh, because that is what I said, you know, uh, beyond 1200 degrees centigrade, uh, you know, uh, uh, at 1200 degrees centigrade or uh, above in this particular steel, you would get uh, primarily late structures. But below 1200 degrees centigrade, then you could perhaps get some benetic or acicular ferritic microstructures, you know. Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, you know just to give you an example of how uh, you know the uh, the heat input, the peak temperatures, the kinetic strength uh, of the thermal cycle influences the austenite drain size, and the cooling rate influences uh, the different microstructures uh, you have uh, you know in the different zones of the you know, heat affected zone. Now. Uh, now I'll get into, uh, 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 you know, the... you know, this is uh, another steel, you know, which uh, uh, I thought I, I, I'll just mention to you, you know, X, X70, you know, we have just started producing in the country, you know, and uh, there's a uh, right from ONGC, NTPC, Indian Oil Corporation, you know, and they, 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 are, they were, the, the, you know, they're putting a lot of these uh, pipelines around the country, you know. So there's a large volume requirement and you know, earlier you were importing these steels, but uh, off late, you know, we have started producing the steels and uh, 
supplying um, you know this is an, uh, this is sort of atmanirbhar bharat you know which we are mentioning so there's a lot of import substitutions on these teams now but you know the, the, there's a, uh, you know there are certain challenges uh, which uh, we are uh, encountering you know uh, uh, while uh, producing these teams and subsequently you know while we are trying to do welding uh, of these teams now the biggest challenge uh, uh, is that you know uh, uh, these teams you know were basically uh, imported hot rolled materials you know uh, conventionally hot rolled materials with richer alloying content you know so when you have richer alloying content you know it's very easy to meet the uh, the different properties in terms of you know the tensile uh, tensile properties elongation properties and even the, and the low toughness requirements of uh, these teams but uh, you know with uh, some of the new new production processes uh, are coming in particularly the today you have very uh, advanced uh, mills uh, in terms of the thermo mechanical processing uh, which are happening you know, in particular tata steel you know we be we put up a new tmcp mill in uh, kalinga nagar you know so you know the, the people are looking at opportunities of making steels with much leaner uh, leaner chemistries okay when and when i talk about leaner chemistries that you know you 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 know today's mills uh, you know they provide uh, microstructural engineering opportunities to meet the the end properties but you know while uh, you know uh, you get the end properties but uh, you know there could be questions around whether you know these steels are weldable or not you know uh, to the fullest extent now there used to be a concern you know when the, you know uh, you know several years back you know people used to look at uh, the carbon equivalent values and uh, you know a thumb rule was anything about 0.30 of Uh, IAW carbon equivalent um, is uh, you know you need to take precautions uh, and there could be welding problems etc etc and anything below 0.30 of uh, um, you know carbon equivalent is uh, you know relatively easy to weld but today you know the, the carbon equivalent concept has, 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 is entirely changing now today there is a, there is a reverse problem the reverse problem is you know today you are able to meet end properties or you, you are able to produce steels Uh, with very low carbon equivalent so you know well you get the mechanical properties um, uh, uh, with the low carbon equivalents because you you have very fine um, um, grains uh, today in the microstructures but <clears throat> you you have certain problems uh, during weldability because <clears throat> you require certain alloys because once in the altered microstructures the one i mentioned in my previous uh, you know in the previous steel so when you go through a temporal cycle you know you have austenite uh, uh, grain and then under the cooling conditions you need to have certain microstructures which would provide strength to the steels and in case of x70 steels you know if uh, your the, if your minimum requirement uh, is around say uh, 70 in ksi of uh, strength you know you need to meet the, uh, that property uh, otherwise you know if there is softening uh, because of extended or, or expand a extensive heat affected zone or grain uh, grain growth then there is a problem now in this steel if you see that uh, <clears throat> and uh, x70 steels are normally submerged arc welded you know and submerged arc welding processes um, they require a higher heat input and in this case you can see 31 kJ per cm for 16 mm thickness of x x70 and uh, 23 for 10 mm Uh, thick uh, uh, material of a uh, x70 and we just to look at you know the cooling rate if you look at the cooling rates 7.9 5.8 you know and these cooling rates are pretty slow so submerged arc welding pro processes are pretty slow so um, uh, but uh, the uh, the point i just wanted to mention is you know in the uh, as per international standards you know um and particularly for uh, for certain cold applications or localities um, in the mountainous or uh, low temperature um, uh, requirements you would require a sharpie impact toughness of 50 kJ greater than 50 kJ with 75% shear fracture at minus 45 degrees centigrade that's a real challenge you know for tropical climates you know 0 degrees centigrade 54 kJ is reasonably okay in the weld or in the heat affected zone but if it is in, 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 in if it is in uh, cold regions you know then you need to meet the minus 45 degree centigrade requirement and that is very uh, challenging so uh, if you look at you know uh, the thermal profiles you know you see these are again uh, model thermal profiles and uh, from this you know we have taken out cooling rates 
Now, if I, uh, you know, this is a borrowed uh, CCT diagram on which, uh, you know, for a similar chemistry, you know, uh, the reference is there, where, you know, we plotted, you know, the cooling rates that we obtained, you know, the red, the red lines, you know, typically, the, the, the red lines, you know, they typically re represents, you know, the cooling rates uh, against the, um, the thermal profiles or the, or the heat inputs uh, that we introduced. Okay, so again, you know, if you see the parent structure is a, you know, a pretty, um, pretty fine uh, uh, structure, uh, uh, reasonable, you know, around uh, maybe around 15 microns maximum, you know, if you take an average, you know, 12 to 15 micron, microns would be the, uh, the, uh, the parent metal microstructure. But, you know, once you get into the uh, force grain heat affected zone uh, of uh, this material, you know, there, um, uh, per centimeter of heat input, you look at the uh, the prior austenite grain size, you know, it, uh, it suddenly jumps to eight or seven micrometer. And uh, if you look at, um, you know, the thicker material, 107 uh, uh, micrometer, and these are pretty large prior austenite grain sizes. And they influence, you know, uh, subsequently influence during cooling, you know, the, uh, the, the microstructures which develop, the bionetic structures, the granular bionetic microstructures, you know, which develop within the uh, uh, within the prior austenite drain site. And if you look at uh, the hardness values, you know, they're 205 HV and 220 HV. So, you know, so, you know, these values, uh, as you can see, you know, they are lower than the base metal. So if the, if the um, uh, uh, you know, the low, uh, the base metal is around 220. So while the coarse grain heat affected in one case is, uh, is very close to the base metal, but in general, you know, there's a lowering of the heat affected zone. But at the same time, you know, this is not alarming. In the, from an acceptance point of view, because it 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 it, it qualifies the basic mechanical properties of tensile and uh, yield yield strength, you know. So uh, so the, there are not much of issues there, but you know the major issue uh, in, in this uh, case is um, uh, that uh, you know you could uh, land up with uh, you know the, along with the prior austenite green side, you could land up with you know some, uh, having you know MA constituents, you know. To the tune of two to three and uh, to uh, three point five percent, you know. So this is the sort of variations, you know. You can see the white portions, you know. So you do have um, MA constituents, uh, which are result of the cooling rate, uh, and, and you know the prior austenite grain size, you know, determines the sort of um, uh, uh, you know the granular bainitic microstructures which uh, which I mentioned, and you know the the granular bainites are not very good from a toughness point of view. So, you know, if you, if at zero degree centigrade, you know, you get reasonably acceptable uh, toughness values, but, you know, and the, you know, this, this, these tests were done on simulated uh, cold strain heat affected zone, because you, you, you know, in a, you know, under, by doing a simulation, you can, uh, you know, produce a synthetic, um, uh, you know, cold strain heat affected zone, you know, without any other zones or any of the parent metal being part of the, um, uh, of the testing process. And uh, so, uh, on in the synthetic um, uh, heat affected zone, uh, you find that uh, you know there is uh, uh, there is uh, you know substantial lowering in the toughness at minus forty degrees centigrade, and this is quite alarming. You know, so so you know you you uh, uh, to, how do you address this problem? You know? So you need to look at you know so you need to look at the metal chemistry which uh, I mentioned. You know, so you know this is one of the challenges. You know, when you are going in for very linear chemistry of um, X70 steels, you know, which have been, uh, you know, uh, and these steels are quite old and acceptable, but, you know, the, the tweaking that is happening in the current generation of steels, you know, you, you, put a, you put a leaner chemistries to attain the properties, but then, you know, you could land up, uh, you know, with um, uh, well toughness properties. And therefore, you know, you, there, there could be reasons to first relook into uh, the, the chemistry of uh, the steel. And second thing, you know, whether you could also uh, uh, find out uh, means and methods uh, during welding uh, to avoid uh, much of granular bainite uh, so that you know, your toughness values are reasonably in the acceptance uh, limit. You know, so this is, uh, this is another example which uh, I just wanted to give you. And uh, you know, I'll just end up uh, with a third example, you know, and this is an, another contemporary steel which I've been working on. Ferrite bainite 70 HR or a hot rolled uh, steel. Now, <clears throat> you know, the first steel that I dealt with, you know, the X80 steel was a 20 millimeter thick um, uh, steel. You know. The simulation was basically a 3D a heat transfer model, uh, which we applied 
for the uh, simulation and did uh, the entire study. In case of the previous seal, you know, which was the, uh, basically a 12 millimeter of uh, API X, uh, sorry, a 10 and a 16 millimeter um, of API X 70 steel, you know, where again the 3D model applies, you know, so you have a three dimensional heat transfer, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, heat transfer or heat dissipation in process, and therefore, you know, your simulation models are based on that. But, you know, this is, uh, you know, if you look at this is again a unique case, and, you know, this is, I mean, the FP780 is uh, a seal, you know, which is meant for several applications, structural applications. It could be wheel rim applications. Um, it could be also for automotive inner you know, panels and uh, um, also for other structural applications um, uh, which are involved. I mean, maybe also in the lifting and excavation segment, you know, which is uh, picky, you know, which is picking up in uh, the country. You know, there's a large influx of very advanced high strength HSLA micro light steel material going into this. So, you know, in this case, you know, four millimeter of HR strip, uh, you know, the heat dissipation is basically through a you know, 2D process, and, you know, because of the, uh, because of the thickness, you know, the limited thickness. So you, you, you have a 2D simulation. So we did a 2D simulation. And when you do a 2D simulation, the cooling rates are bound to be uh, high. So if you see the delta T eight by five in this thing, you know, 102 seconds, whereas in the previous case, you know, you know they were much, much, much uh, lesser. You, know, you had, uh, you know, delta T eight by five around uh, 35 to 40 seconds. Um, but in case of 2D simulations, you have a heat sink in case of a four millimeter HR strip. So, um, uh, and since prim uh, primarily the heat dissipation is through conduction, uh, but in this case, you know, in thinner sheets, it's primarily through radiation and convection. A very small amount of heat is dissipated um, you know, through, um, by conduction. Therefore, it takes a, a bit of a time. So now if we if we plot, uh, you know, if we now take this, uh, um, you know, the thermal plots, um, uh, thermal plots uh, corresponding to this four millimeter HR strip of the ferrite benite 780 steel, then, you know, perhaps, you know, this red one, uh, again, you know, this CCT is a borrowed CCT, which represents, you know, something very close. This is, again, you know, let me tell you, this is not a weld CCT because uh, the weld CCT, CCT preparation takes a long time and, you know, the boys, uh, my colleagues are, uh, you know, uh, you know, they are working on developing um, the different CT CCTs for different, uh, uh, um, the, you know, the most of modern steels that uh, we are trying to produce, you know. But I just wanted to give you an example, you know, that if you impose uh, the cooling, uh, the, 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 you know, the cooling rates uh, on, on the conventional CCT diagram, uh, then, then, um, you know, th th this, this would represent, and that there, if you find that you have a fair, you have a ferrite bay and also have a bainitic bay. So you almost have 60% of, uh, you know, um, bainite uh, in, in the steel. And, you know, the, exactly that is what is happening. If you look into the microstructure, so, uh, you know, the base metal microstructure will have 40% of ferrite and 60% of bainite. But, you know, in, in, in the coarse grain heat affected zone and the, uh, if you look at the IC heat affected zone, uh, you, 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 you have, you know, again, you know, the, the pyrostenite grain size you can see is significant in the coarse grain heat affected zone. You can make out from the microstructure. So there's a lot of degenerated bainites uh, uh, happening. And um, uh, here, you know, in the uh, IC has, you know, uh, because of the low temperature, I mentioned this again in, during the X8 uh, uh, presentations that, you know, since uh, uh, there is insufficient time for grain, uh, the austenite grains to grow. So, they, you know, the, the hardenability uh, is um, uh, on the lower side. And that, you know, uh, helps in producing these eco acts uh, you know, ferrite fer uh, grains. So, if you look at the base metal microstructure, you know, which is uh, the, the uh, typically a ferrite bainite uh, uh, microstructure with a lot of uh, dislocation density. And dislocation density is observed, um, uh, I think, in subsequent slides um, uh, uh, observed in the transmission electron microscopes. You have a hardness of 300 Hb. But, uh, you know, uh, when you, uh, you know, in the CG has, you know, uh, there, uh, you know, the entire uh, things go through an evolution, but the hardness it doesn't change much because even if there is a grain growth, you know, subsequent uh, uh, bainite which forms, you know, uh, that uh, uh, you know, that matches with the hardness of the base material. Some disturbance. I think somebody has to mute uh, the mic. Yeah. So if you look at the. Uh, Doctor Rao. Doctor Rao. Yes. 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 Please back up. Try to try to control. Try to finish. We are. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, just two. Uh, this is my. I think so. By uh, uh, 
Okay. 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 Yeah. So, but I think so. You so you have P two X strings, you know, and you know what is critical in this particular steel you can uh, have is you know the, the this softening in the HV uh, X uh, in the intercritical has you know of two hundred and five HV from three hundred. This is uh, this is most critical, you know, and the failure takes place in this zone. So if I look into some of this, uh, if I very quickly get into you know some of these uh, plots, you know, you see that the, the grain size and the precipitates which are there in the microstructure. Uh, the hardness is uh, in the in the heat affected zone is until it comes in the uh, intercritical heat affected zone, you know, where there is softening. Uh, otherwise, there's not much of a change. So in case of FP7, the intercritical heat affected zone uh, seems to be the most critical. You know, the, the phase transformation which happens in terms of uh, precipitate, uh, you know, uh, grain growth, uh, precipitate growth change in my microstructure, uh, you know, this, this zone becomes uh, quite critical. So I'll just rush through the slide, you know, I think so this is my last slide. And uh, so, you know, what were, you know, the, also we did some EBSD to find out that, you know, uh, in, in the intercritical heat affected zone, uh, you know, the low angle uh, grain boundaries are of a lesser extent, you know. Uh, so, you know, the, um, uh, so, you know, the, uh, the base material is a strained material. And therefore, if, you, if I compare with the base material, the, you know, the, uh, the, the lower strain material, as the, there is a strain free happening, you know, this, because, this softening affects, uh, you know, uh, the mechanical properties, uh, particularly uh, most of the failures happen in the IC has in, in, in such sort of schemes, you know. So, uh, I think so. Uh, I just wanted to summarize, uh, just to tell you that, uh, uh, that the kinetic strength of the temporal profile influences precipitation, resolution, austenite grain growth, and you know, the Zena effect in chemistry is chemistry dependent and has a major role on controlling the grain growth and the has. And then you know you subsequently have the event two, which is the phase transformation. Uh, you you could have reprecipitation or change of precipitation. And uh, the, the phases would depend on the prior austenite grain size, uh, which uh, which is uh, which can be very well complemented by the CCT diagram. And uh, you know the structure property correlation in the has is largely dependent on the well thermal input and the prior uh, material history. Uh, I think so. With that, I would like to conclude this presentation. Thank you.